Hylas, Wormas here. Welcome to the secrets of the All Rune. It's been some time since my last video, but here I am finally back again. Since time immemorial, humanity has revered the fire. A primeval element which carries the power to warm us, help us prepare our food, and give us light in darkness, but which also carries the essence of utter destruction which can incinerate our cosmic shells into ashes. All around our planet, mankind came to revere, appease and or fear the primal essence of fire. In the Norse cosmology, fire is one of two primeval elements, the other element being ice, and manifested in the fiery world Muspel or Muspelsheimen home of the primordial elemental fire giants. Fire plays key roles in both the creation and the destruction myths within the Norse Germanic tradition. In the Vedic religion, the fire became deified into the god Agni, fire. Within the Hindu tradition, Agni became conceptualized to exist in three levels. On earth as fire, in the atmosphere as lightning and in the sky as the sun. This made him a messenger between the gods and the humans. Still today Agni is honored by many Hindus and is considered the guardian deity of the southeastern direction. Around February or March by the Holika Dehen, Holika's death, that is the first night of the important holiday Huli, Bonfires are burnt where Agni marks the divine energy. These pyres symbolizes the burning of Hulika, a female Asura, demonic being, who according to the 7th century Sanskrit drama Ratnaval was burnt to death with the help of the god Vishnu. The Huli festival symbolizes the victory over evil and signifies the arrival of spring and the end of winter. Considering that Agni is the guardian deity of the southeast, this makes sense since south is on the northern hemisphere associated with increasing warmth and heat, and east is the direction of the dawn, foreboding the rising sun, Surya, one of the manifestations of Agni. In the Rig Veda, Agni, under the name Matari Swan, recovers the fire and gives it back to the humans. This reminds us of other myths around the world, where fire was a divine element destined to serve the gods only. In for example Greek mythology, the titan Prometheus steals the fire from the gods and gives it to the humans. For this Zeus punished Prometheus to eternally lay bound on a rock while an eagle eats his liver which grows back again until the next day. The holy aspect of fire is very much present also within another tradition with Indo-European roots, namely Zoroastrianism. Within Zoroastrianism, fire, Atar, is one of the two agents of purification, the other one being water, Aban. Through fire as medium, spiritual insight and wisdom can be obtained. Water is seen as the source of the same wisdom. Within the same Indo-Aryan sphere as Zoroastrianism, we can also find parts of the roots to the so-called Iranian New Year, Novruz, literally New Day. Even if this festivity has its root among the Iranian peoples, like for example Persians and Kurds, it later spread also to neighboring peoples. Novruz is celebrated by the spring equinox, approximately March 21st. By the festivity it's common to light bonfires, which should drive away the bad and replace it with warmth, health and energy. The pyres also symbolize the passing of the dark season, winter, 
and the arrival of spring, the season of light. In the celebrations it's also common that men jump over the fires. What is interesting here is that we see similar traditions also within the borders of the European continent. I will try to go through some of them and focus on the, according to me, most remarkable details. The time span of the various festivities that I chose to present in this video is spanning from the end of February until the end of June. So let's go through them as they fall into the calendar. By the end I will try to give my own analysis of the whole thing. Already a month before the spring equinox, by February 21st each year, there is a festivity called Bikebrennen in northern Low Saxon and Bikebronen in North Frisian, both names meaning beacon burning. In South Jutish it's called Persauten, St. Peter's Eve. This festival is taking place in the North Frisian areas of northern Germany and southern Denmark. The festivity consists of lighting a bonfire on a beach by the sea and sing songs. The intention of the tradition has changed during the centuries, but is believed to stem from pagan times. With Christianity the tradition came to be associated with St. Peter. Later during the 17th and 18th centuries the event was instead seen as giving good luck to the men leaving their homes to go whaling. It was then the wives of the whalers that lit the beacons to keep the men safe. It is also said that the fires should expel ill-willing spirits and protect new seeds. The celebration symbolizes a farewell to winter and should as such most likely be seen as a spring festival. In some villages a noose is burnt up in the pyre, maybe symbolizing winter consumed by heat. In connection with Perf's Auten, it is in southern Jutland common to sing the song Vidkete, which attempts to foretell the history of the tradition from pagan times to the era of whaling. I will post a link here to where you can listen to an interpretation of the song performed by Drones and Bellows together with Trauxet's duo. By the so-called Ash Wednesday, February March, or by March 1st, the festival Funkenfeuer, Sparks Fire, is celebrated in a huge area centered mainly around the Swabian parts of the Alp region. That is parts of southwestern Germany, parts of Austria, Liechtenstein, parts of Switzerland, parts of eastern France, parts of northern Italy, as well as among the Sato Mare Swabians in Romania. By the festivity a doll of a witch, sometimes called Funkenhexe, spark witch, is placed on the fire. This doll is often filled with gunpowder and when it explodes it should promise good luck to the spectators. If the pyre burns out before the witch explodes, it is seen as a bad omen and the witch doll is instead buried by a ceremony the following Sunday. The background of the Funkenfeuer tradition has been debated. All the way back until the 18th century it has been claimed to have had pagan origin. Many modern researchers argue though that the festivity should be seen as connected with the end of the Christian carnival season in the Swabian region. Me personally think that they make it a little bit too easy for themselves by just linking it to Christian customs. Since it obviously falls into a bigger pattern we can see across a huge geographical area during the same time of the year. But well, let me continue giving you more examples of these kind of holidays. By March 21st or by the first Sunday of Lent, bonfires are lit often on top of hills in Luxembourg as well as in parts of Belgium, France and Germany. This celebration goes under names like Burgbrennen, Luxembourgish or Burgbrennen, German. Burg in this context seems to have nothing to do with the word burg, meaning castle, but got its etymology from the Latin comboro, consume. The latter part, brennen, is German for to burn, so it means something like consume by burning. Dimanche de Brondon, in France and Belgium, Sunday of firebrand. 
or Hüttenbrennen in the Eiffel region of Germany, hut burning. Also this celebration is believed to have sprung from pre-Christian traditions connected with the spring equinox, March 21st, but later became associated with Christian Lent traditions, something which clearly can be seen in the burning of a cross on top of the pyre. The Hüttenbrennen tradition in Eiffel differ a little bit from the others in that the celebration can also contain a wheel of fire rolled down a hill. This wheel is said to symbolize the life-giving sun of the spring and is also called the wheel of joy. Consumption of eggs, cooked in various ways, is also closely associated with Hüttenbrennen. The clear associations with the welcoming of the spring season for sure gives the festivity more of an animistic nature in its core rather than a purely Christian. One of the important spring holidays for many contemporary Westerners is Easter. There have already been several attempts to explain the etymology and pre-Christian background of the holiday, so I won't go into depth with that part, I will though say some things. It seems like the name of the holiday got its name from a Germanic goddess called Aestre in Old English and Ostara in Old High German. In her reconstructed proto-Germanic form, she would have been called Austro, meaning dawn. The name is etymologically comparable with other Indo-European goddesses, for example the Roman Aurora, the Greek Eos, or the Vedic Ushas, all assumingly deriving from the presumable proto-Indo-European goddess Heusos, the dawn. Of interest here is also to notice that the cardinal direction east partly derives from the same etymological root, the Proto-Indo-European heus, dawn, and obviously refer to the direction of the sunrise. We can thus say that the Germanic Austro most likely should be interpreted as a dawn goddess. This goddess also seems to have given name to the month Estormonad in Old English, attested by the Venerable Bede in the 8th century, and Ostara Manot in Old High German, attested in the Frankish calendar mentioned by the 8th and 9th century scholar Einhardt. This month would equal the month of April in our modern calendar. There are some various discussions among scholars whether or not the holiday Easter got its name from the goddess or the month. Personally, I lean more towards that the goddess is the root. However, in the end it's irrelevant in the way that Easter anyway got its etymology connected with the dawn. Isn't it odd by the way that Christmas, which should celebrate the birth of Christ, got a fixed date, but Easter, which commemorates the death and resurrection of Christ, got a date dependent on the lunisolar calendar? In the Western churches, Easter always falls into the first weekend after the first full moon after the spring equinox. That kind of fluctuating time point seemed more related to an almost animistic pagan way of thinking than a set date as for example Christmas or the celebrations of various saints. Easter is thus dependent upon the spring equinox. It's thus not hard to think the next step, namely that the festivity most likely carries traditions of pre-Christian vernal character. As I see it, Easter is a holiday centered around a resurrection. The Christians see it as the resurrection of Christ and the salvation and hope that it symbolizes. From a pagan perspective, Easter instead symbolizes the resurrection of life in nature after the winter dominated by death. That the vernal equinox is associated with the dawn is not strange either, since it astrologically is the turning point of when the day becomes longer than the night. It's thus the beginning of half a year dominated by light. Metaphorically speaking, the dawn can be seen as the birth of this light, light arriving from the east. Let us go back to the main theme of the video, bonfires. In parts of northwestern Europe, it's custom to light pyres by Easter. 
it seems like the custom began in the Netherlands and northern Germany. The oldest mentioning of this custom is from the 7th century missionary Boniface that wrote to Pope Zachary about the nuisance with Ignis Pacalis Passover fires among the Germanic peoples. Since Boniface asks about how we should deal with this phenomenon, it's obvious that it was a custom unknown to these Christians. Thus, it must have had a pagan origin, where it probably symbolized the arrival of the life of spring by chasing away the death of winter with fire. The fertility symbolism of bonfires also became more directly implied as the remaining ashes became good fertilizer. As with many other pre-Christian customs, the Catholic Church later seems to have appropriated the fire custom and linked it with Christ as the light of the world. In our contemporary times, Easter fires are often seen mainly as social events where people gather around the pyres to enjoy beverages and snacks together. From the previously mentioned original area, the custom later came to spread also to, for example, Denmark, southwestern Sweden, Finland, parts of Switzerland and parts of Austria. In some areas of, for example, Germany and Sweden, it is still common that the witch effigy is made and placed in the middle of the pyre. In Swedish folk tradition, the Easter fires also came to be lit to scare witches flying to or from the mythical place Blåkulla, meaning the blue hill or the black hill, since blue and black been seen as synonymous in older North Germanic vocabulary. It's often though seen as deriving from Blocksberg, the main location of the witch sabbat in German folklore, a bit more about that later. Blocksberg probably became Blockkulla and later Blåkulla in some sort of folk etymological process. In the folklore Blåkulla is described in various ways but is always seen as the location of the devil's witch sabbat to celebrate the death of Christ on the Good Friday. Several of geographical locations have been claimed to be Blåkulla. Among the most famous of these is the island Blåjungfrun in the Strait of Kalmar between the Swedish mainland and the island province Öland, a place with a lot of legends and mysteries about it which I might even do another video about in the future, if I get the possibility. The flight of witches has often been given a connection with so-called flying ointment. This highly hallucinogenic salve, which could contain extracts from plants such as, for example, henbane, belladonna, hemlock, wolfsbane and or jimson weed, is said to have been smeared upon the body of the witch or upon the broomstick or other tool which the witch then astrode, implying that the ointment was absorbed by the mucous membranes of the vulva. In this hallucinogenic intoxication it would thus give the witch the sensation as if flying upon the broomstick. We can compare this with the Old Norse expression Gandreider, ride upon a magical staff, which denotes a ride of supernatural spirits across the sky. The Gandreider phenomenon together with the witch's flying ointment give us indications of that the concept of the flight of witches very well could have a pre-Christian background, according to me probably associated with the magical trance-like practice of Seder, which also involves the use of a Gander or Völur, that is a magical staff. The witches might hence, at least in a Nordic Germanic context, hypothetically originally been völur, staff carriers. Those are seeresses or female magical practitioners within the Old Norse culture. The close association with witches and Easter within especially Sweden and Swedish-speaking Finland did with time get a less serious connection. Starting by the beginning of the 19th century and becoming common in the middle of the same century, custom to dress up like witches, påskkärringar, easter hags in Swedish, became a common part of the Easter celebrations. Originally it was something done by adults and teenagers, but with time it became more and more seen as something for children. The tradition is similar to the trick-or-treating done by Halloween, 
the dressed up witches walk from house to house, often given handmade greeting cards and asks for treats in return. The close association of witches with Easter have made them very common symbol for the holiday in Sweden, especially witches wearing a kerchief, riding broomsticks to Blåkulla and often together with a black cat and a coffee pan. As I explained before, Easter is a holiday which shifts dates between each year, but it will always occur sometime between March 22nd and April 25th, depending on the moon phases compared to the spring equinox. A bonfire holiday that got a more fixed timing is the festivity Sexeleuten, six sounding, in Zurich, Switzerland. The name referring to an old tradition to end the workday when the biggest bell of the Großmünster church chimes by 6 p.m. instead of by 5 p.m. as it did during the winter half of the year. It's thus a festivity to mark the passing into the summer half of the year. The festival shows clear similarities with for example the previously mentioned but earlier in the calendar Funkenfeuer tradition. A wooden construction is built and a rag doll filled with explosives called book, related to the English word boogeyman, is placed on top. A book was initially a disobedient and scary masked character in the carnival traditions. The time it takes for the doll to explode from that the pyre is lit is said to predict the character of the coming summer. A fast explosion promises a warm and sunny summer, while a prolonged burning until the explosion foretells a cold and rainy summer. The next holiday with bonfire connections is probably more like a pair of two holidays, but which belong together. April 30th and or May 1st are associated with spring festivities in various parts of Europe. The bonfire custom this time of the year seems to have spread from areas such as the Netherlands, Northern Germany and Czechia to also Slovenia, Sweden, Finland, the Baltic countries and parts of Norway. The tradition to lit pyres by the shift between April and May is already documented in the 8th century when the Catholic Church condemned the practice as ungodly and heathen. This type of fire is called Nordfeuer need fire in German. It is a type of magical protective and purifying fire which we can find traces of across Eurasia from India to the Slavic, Celtic and Germanic areas of Europe. The way how the fire is lit varies a bit between different geographical regions, but it often involves the friction heat of rubbing wood against wood. And as an attempt to counteract this so-called pagan witchcraft, the church tried to establish the Feast of St. Valpurga on April 30th. The holiday is still often called Valpurgis Night, Valpurgis Nacht, Valborg, or something similar today because of this. With the Saint holiday, also the bonfires became appropriated by Christianity as a symbol to ward off ill willing spirits and witches because just like the Swedish Easter celebrations are associated with witch sabbats, so is Valpurgis night. In the folk tradition it was seen as if witches flew to the Blocksberg or Kocken mountain in the Hafts mountain region in Germany to take part in a sabbat with the devil there. If we analyze this it seems as if Valpurgis night was when the witches traveled to be in time for the sabbat on May 1st, in other words May Day. It's thus May Day and not Valpurgis that is the real main event of these combined holidays. The tales about witches and sabbats are most likely just Christian attempts to demonize an older pagan spring cult connected with May Day. Some of the features of Valpurgis are very similar to other bonfire festivities. In Czechia a figure of a witch is burnt. Just like in Swedish Easter legends witches are claimed to gather for a sabbat. In Estonia children dress up like witches and in parts of Dalarna province of Sweden there is a custom to dress up in monster costumes and also to jump through fire. The main event is otherwise the social gathering around the pyre and maybe sing songs and having some drinks and food together. Another name for the Valpurgis night is Hexenacht, Witches Night. 
and is a name which many contemporary pagans prefer to use. Some modern heathens also associate Valpurgis Night with the Old Norse Seeger Float, Victory Sacrifice, while others decide to place this float by the Spring Equinox. As I mentioned before, the Valpurgis Night seems in fact just to be the initial night of celebration before the festivities on May Day. In some parts of Europe, both parts are celebrated, while in others there is just a focus on one of the two. May Day is celebrated in for example England, Germany, Austria, Czechia and parts of the Netherlands and Belgium. There is much that could be said about May Day, but what I want to mention here as worth noticing are the maypoles that are erected in many places. In his video about May Day celebrations, Tom of Survive the Jai mentions that festivities were condemned as pagan already in the 1500s. The maypoles most likely have a pre-Christian fertility symbolism behind them. Tom also mentions some customs concerning collection of dew in the morning of May Day and how it has been seen as having various magical or medicinal properties within for example English, Irish, Scottish and Romanian folk traditions. This gives us very interesting parallels with the final of the holidays I want to mention in this video, namely Midsummer. Midsummer is one of the most important holidays of the year in Sweden. If we look around Europe, it's celebrated around the time of the summer solstice, approximately June 21st. The date can vary slightly from culture to culture. In Sweden, the Åland Islands and parts of Swedish-speaking Finland, it's common to erect maypoles and dance around them. I won't talk more about the maypoles here though, but of course the parallel with maypoles by May Day should be noted. The attempt to appropriate Midsummer as a Christian festivity can be seen in many countries where the holiday got names associated with Saint John the Baptist. June 24th became a feast day for the saint which can be seen in the various regional names of the holiday. For example called Sankt Hans in Norway and Denmark, Jai in Latvian, Johannus in Finnish, Jani Pev in Estonian, etc. All partly deriving from the classical Latin name of John the Baptist, namely Ioannes. As you can see from my name examples, the midsummer celebrations are spread out to more countries than just Sweden, but often under names with connection to John the Baptist. In fact, we can find celebrations around the time of the summer solstice more or less all over Europe, and many of the customs are similar. Going back to the bonfire theme, these are a very common feature in many regions, for example in Denmark, Norway, Finland, the Baltic countries, Russia, Ukraine, Hungary, France and parts of Germany and England, just to mention some. In Denmark the bonfires are said to scare the witches flying to the witch sabbat on either Blocksbjerg, that is Blockberg mountain again, Heckenfell, Hekla, a volcano in Iceland, or Lydholm, a mountain in Norway by the city of Bergen. In Denmark it also occurs that children dress up like witches by Sankt Hens and that a witch figure is burnt on the pyre. This also happens in parts of Norway. As you can see the Danes are doing very similar activities by midsummer as what the Swedes are doing by Easter. In for example the three Baltic countries, Russia, Ukraine and parts of Germany, it's a custom to jump through the fires by midsummer. As insinuated previously concerning the Jew of May Day, we see a similar practice by midsummer in for example Sweden and Lithuania. That is the custom to roll yourself in and or collect the morning dew by midsummer, since it's believed to contain magical or medicinal properties. These were some examples of holidays related with bonfires and other connected spring associated elements, but there are many more around Europe. For example, the Gaelic Celtic Beltane with strong associations with fire, or the Romanian Armideni festival with connections both with maypoles and the importance of morning dew. And there are of course traditions with bonfires also other times of the year than during the spring. 
However, the main reason with this video was to present the clear pattern around these various spring holidays. So what can we conclude? 1. In a time span from February to June, in a geographical area from India to Northern Europe, we see similar customs with bonfires marking the shift from winter to spring or summer. 2. In many of these traditions, a humanoid effigy, often a witch, is burnt, symbolizing the victory of life over death. 3. Several of the traditions are associated with the traveling of witches to a Sabbath. 4. Jumping through fire is a reoccurring element, possibly with purifying purposes. 5. Maypoles are erected by some of the festivals. 6. The holidays are connected with benevolent energies of both fire and water, that is for example the morning dew. And possibly also the element earth concerning the close association with flowers and green trees. My analysis of this is that there must lie some older common tradition in the background. All these similarities cannot be results of mere coincidences and or modern influences but rather remnants of something archaic, maybe even with Indo-European background. The bonfire elements can be found around various parts of Europe, but it seems to be especially important among the Germanic, Celtic and Slavic peoples. If they have affected each other and who then was first is hard to say, but it could just as well just come from a common primordial source culture. The long time span in the calendar from when this original holiday has been celebrated is most likely based upon regional climates. The central point still seems to be the spring equinox or the time after it when the effects really start to become noticeable in nature. This is the reason why it can stretch as far into the year as midsummer since the warmth arrives much later in Scandinavia than further south. When I now attempted to present this broad pattern, I hope you better understand that to be able to comprehend our contemporary customs, we sometimes have to take some steps back and widen the view. It's the similarities in the big picture that can tell us the core. What we then aim to use is up to us. The tradition is only worth something from a spiritual perspective if we give it a purpose. In my next video I will therefore try to present a bit of my own implementation of this in my own spiritual practices. Remember that it's only up to you to keep traditions alive. If you have personal experiences of some special bonfire traditions, please feel free to write something about it in the comment section below. Don't forget to mention from where you experienced it so we can further map up the extent of this custom. Thanks for watching this video, if you want to support my continuous work with my channel please subscribe and click the bell button below to stay notified of future uploads.